This is Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast where we bring Jesus into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey guys, welcome to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. My email address, jason at sportspectrum.com. You can reach me directly. Anything you want to say, any thoughts, any future guest ideas, any comments or thoughts on today's interview with Donnie Jones from Stetson, you can email me directly, jason at sportspectrum.com. Dot com. And we are presented today by Ronald Blue Trust. Their advisor is applying biblical wisdom and technical expertise to help their clients make wise financial decisions, experiencing clarity and confidence, and leaving a lasting legacy. A lot of us are looking for clarity and confidence today in the midst of a pandemic still going on. A lot of questions about our finances. Ronald Blue Trust is the place to turn and ask those questions. We trust them. We know you will too. Check them out at ronblue.com, ronblue.com. Very excited to welcome Donnie Jones from Stetson University, their men's basketball coach, joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. And this is one of those interviews where you're going to want to grab a pen, grab a piece of paper, maybe get your phone out, take the notes section and get it ready because Donnie has tons of nuggets and wisdom and quotes that he says here in our interview today that I wrote down and I know you'll want to write down too as you listen. As I said, he is the Stetson men's basketball coach. He came to Stetson prior to the 2019-2020 season and last year he won 16 games and nine win improvement over the previous season. That's the most in the country last year for a first year head coach. And Donnie has been coaching basketball for 30 years. More than 700 wins in his coaching career as an assistant and as a head coach. He spent 11 seasons with the Florida Gators and Billy Donovan, helping them to consecutive national championships in 2006 and 2007. He's had head coaching stops at Marshall, at UCF, Central Florida, and now at Stetson. And this is a lot of fun because we hear about Donnie's faith journey. We hear about what it's like to coach and create a culture right now in the middle of a pandemic. And then we had story time and the stories that he tells about his time in Florida and also his time coaching UCF. You see, when he was a coach at Central Florida, he coached Marcus and Jeffrey Jordan. If you don't know who Marcus and Jeffrey Jordan is, well, you certainly know their dad, Michael Jordan, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And so Donnie Jones was the head coach of Michael Jordan's kids when he was at University of Central Florida. So we have a Michael Jordan story in here. We have a University of Florida Gators national championship story. And we have a, well, let's just say it's a specific WWE superstar story that Donnie Jones shares. This is a lot of fun. Take a listen to Donnie Jones from Stetson joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. Donnie, welcome to the show. Oh, Jason, it's great to be with you. It's good to see you. Good to talk to you. We're on Zoom, like a lot of these interviews have been, because of all of us having to learn about Zoom <laughs> with the pandemic, Coach. How are you doing through all this? We're, we're six, we're half a year into this thing now. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, each day has been a, a new challenge. Uh, that's for sure, Jason. Uh, you know, obviously, when this started, we were trying to figure out a way with our team how to communicate. Uh, and how can we be able to be impactful as a coach uh, with not seeing our guys or touching our guys? So we all, like you just mentioned, become Zoom experts pretty quick. Uh, but we were trying to make sure our kids become Zoom experts because uh, learning to communicate with them on the other end well, was a challenge uh, quite earlier. That's so hard. And I have to imagine, you know, you've been coaching for a long time. This has been a complete pivot not to, you know, to use a basketball term for you, it has to be a complete pivot for you and your staff and just how you've gone about everything maybe you've learned in the past 30 years in trying to become a coach during, you know, this crazy time. Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, uh, one of my assistants is somebody you know well, Brendan Sir, yeah. uh, who has uh, his company coaching you, and he's been doing all these master coaching classes. And uh, I joke all the time. I said I never went to one clinic uh, this year, coach, uh, where they taught me how to use Zoom in coaching, or they told me how to deal with the pandemic in coaching. So uh, it's been a new uh, uh, opportunity, that's for sure. And, and you know what? What's amazing, Jason, it's just like anything. Kids are so resilient. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, even our kids, I got 11 freshmen and sophomore, so relatively a young team. Uh, but the patience, 
and the ability to adjust and adapt has been remarkable uh, for our team uh, during this time. So what about preparing, you know, we're taping this in the early fall, right? And usually you're in kind of prep mode as you get ready for the season. And we're hoping there's a season. We're believing there's going to be a season. And even that, because everything else is so uncertain, but we believe that there'll be a season. But what's it been like kind of preparing and getting in the mode of another college basketball season upon us? Yeah, you know, well, there's just been different phases. You know, the first phase, we were just hope to get together. Uh, we were just thankful this summer to have a chance to get all of our guys on campus, uh, get them all together again, refocus them. Uh, and then it's almost like starting over teaching. Uh, we had to go back to the fundamentals because he's only allowed one guy at a time in the gym, no groups bigger than four. So here we are coaching with mask, coaching mm -hmm. with gloves, uh, only one guy could touch the basketball. So all these things have become different challenges for us as coaches, but had to reteach the game early. And then now as we've progressed on here, now into the fall, getting closer, obviously for the season starting here, now it's it's been we've been able to get back with our groups and, uh, and you know, it could all change tomorrow. Uh, we talk about protecting our circle, Jason, and that's just really knowing where we're at, who we're around, the choices we're making. And, uh, and we talk about that so much because one person breaks the circle, uh, it impacts us all, uh, where we could be shut down for 14 days and, and not being able to practice. So we would have to start back over in, in a sense with how we go about things. Protecting the circle is, I mean, obviously there's a protecting the circle to keep everybody healthy, but there's like a larger view of that too, right? As a, as a coach trying to develop a culture and the circle is your team, your unit, What's that been like trying to build a culture? It's only been a little over a year um, since, uh, since you've been with Stetson. What's that been like kind of coming to a new place and instilling, installing, and creating this culture that you hear so much about in different circles? Well, I've been really fortunate, Jason. I've been around some great coaches. Uh, obviously, Billy Donovan, my first 13 years, and watched him go to Marshall, change the culture, and then what he done at Florida. Obviously, I was fortunate to be a part of that, of win a couple national championships. But, but then I've had a chance. This is my third job rebuilding. Uh, I was at Dayton just a year before with Anthony Grant as he was transforming that program. So I've been been blessed just to be around some great character guys and coaches who understood how to build people first, which become teams. And so our whole focus has been from the individual and growing guys individually, socially, spiritually, uh, and, and growing them physically. And, and, you know, in one year, Jason, we, it's been fortunate for us, you know, we talk about in our circle voices and choices. And it's so important for the voices these young people hear uh, during this day is, is a lot of the choices they make. And uh, so we've really tried to control the message, uh, really selling hope and vision and, and what success looks like. Because, you know, we've walked into a place that hadn't had a lot of success. We've never won a championship here. We've never been to an NCAA tournament. And last year, you know, our first season, we had eight new players and we had plus nine wins, which was the best wins in college basketball uh, taking over a program last year. So we've done a lot of good things and it's really a credit to these kids and uh, with their commitment of really just buying in to, to where, not where we're at, but where we can get to. So with all of the basketball side, you're also, you know, a family guy and there's things away from the basketball world that you kind of have to navigate. And this 2020 has been the navigating of all navigating, I feel like for, for so many of us. So what's been that, what's that side of your life, Donnie, been like for you in 2020, I mean, it started in March, you know, and basketball was canceled and everything else was, was postponed. And here we are now into the fall. So it's been a six, seven month journey for you as Donnie Jones, the husband, the dad, Johnny Jones, the guy, yeah. not the coach. What's that been like? Yeah. You know what? It's been a, uh, be honest about Jason. It's, um, you know, fear's a liar. We talk about that all the time. And, and we talking about, you know, even in the promise there's, there's problems and, and we we got to be able to embrace that and trust that during this time that there's a purpose for it. Uh, it's something we don't know. Uh, you know, faith is a, an amazing thing that, that I've always been uh, focused on uh, with my family and who we are and, and how can we grow through this and, and how can we help most importantly others grow through it. And so when we're coaches, sometimes we just think basketball is all we're here for, but it's really a platform to lead other people. And, and, you know, doing that yourself, uh, you know, how you've impacted people with your platform in sports. And, and it's the same impact here. Uh, I think with these young kids, it's a great time for them to refocus on the things that, that, that are most important. That'd be our family, be our faith, and just understand the, 
the impact of this is, is not forever, uh, that we have to be able to persevere through these times. And, and that's what we've done. Uh, you know, I've had a, a blessing. My daughter's a sophomore here at Stetson. She goes to school here. Uh, my son's a sophomore and my daughter's a seventh grader. It's given us a chance here through our travels to really focus on each other and, and spend a lot of quality time together. We're a close family anyway, but now being able to share that with our team and, and be able to deal with this situation is only going to grow us to make us better. Mm -hmm. Donnie Jones is our guest here on Sports Spectrum, the Stetson men's basketball coach. You alluded to your faith. I'd love to hear where that faith kind of took shape for you and, and how that's really shaped you, informed you throughout your journey. Yeah, you know, I was fortunate. I was always growing up in a home, obviously, where faith was important. But, uh, but you know, it seems like it's older. When you get older and you turn 18, I think you get a chance to really choose your faith uh, and what you've learned. But now you go out in the real world without your mom and dad, and, and you have a lot of choices in front of you, a lot of opportunities and real life hits you uh, with, with uh, being able to impact your faith. But, you know, I really found my faith through a guy who was a uh, minister in uh, West Virginia when I was at Marshall University, uh, a guy named Roger Adams, who's a great man. He's with Nations of Coaches, a great spiritual company that, that yes. still partners along yes. with my teams. And, uh, and, you know, Roger really brought me to the Lord and, and obviously grew my faith. And, and, and ever since that day, I was, I was a young graduate assistant at Marshall University. Uh, I really found uh, uh, the true meaning of, of uh, God and, and the impact it can have not only on my life, but in other people's lives. So he was uh, the guy married my wife and I and been a lifelong friend. And, and obviously I've partnered aside, alongside of him with a, with a lot of other people to help guide people to, to a special place. Yeah. Nations of coaches. I love them. Uh, we've been a part of them and, and, and worked with them and I've been privileged to be around them a lot. Can you just, I'd love to just take five minutes to have you talk about them or a few minutes just to have you talk about the impact that they've had. You, we've already kind of mentioned it in terms of leading you to Christ, but really in terms of discipling and allowing you to be a coach for a greater purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Nations of Coaches, uh, uh, it, it began obviously with uh, Roger Adams. Uh, he partnered up with them and got out of the ministry and joined them. And, uh, and they had a great mission for, and it's, and it's an important mission. I, I really believe in what they've done. Uh, they partner alongside of coaches. The coaches go through so much uh, stress, so much struggle, uh, so much identity. And sometimes, you know, who do we turn to? Sometimes we don't really have somebody to listen to us sometimes. And I think they've done a great job in really equipping coaches to help equip student athletes. And I think it's a really unique partnership, unlike FCA, which has a purpose as well uh, with the student athlete, they've really focused on the coaches and their marriages and, and the relationships of the home as well as uh, with their uh, teams. And Tommy Cowell, obviously, is the director, is a, is a great man. He's, he's built this. Uh, they're impacting you know, programs all across the country. So uh, I got great respect for them. Pete Weary uh, is a guy that spends a lot of time with our program. Pete's a great man and, uh, yep. and, and become a great friend. As yeah, well. I love, I love Pete. I've gotten to meet Roger and I know Tommy very well. He was on the podcast and just a tremendous group of people. Uh, they call it, you know, the master coach playing for the master coach, which I, I, I absolutely are coaching for the master coach, which I absolutely love. Let me ask you about that balance and what that's like, because you have a coach, you're, you're a coach coaching kids. So you're pouring into kids all the time and it's busy. It's, 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 it can be taxing, you know, you can be all encompassing, all consuming into it. And, you know, I hear a lot of people who work in jobs that are very stressful. Even when my time at ESPN, a lot of people would say, I, it's very hard for me to find time for other things, to think about other things. And if you're a person of faith, that's really where our priority is supposed to be. So how do you balance all of that? Knowing the demands of being a head coach can really be taxing. Absolutely. Well, you know, my day begins every morning, Jason, obviously with prayer uh, and, it, and I'm intentional uh, with it. Uh, I know that is the, uh, the strength that's going to equip me through any challenges uh, that's coming. Uh, there's nothing we can do ourselves. We found this out during this pandemic right now. There's nothing man can and handle or we're, we're still fighting it and trying to figure it out but uh, there's only one person can really get us through that and so it's important I think uh, for 
and for, from a leadership standpoint as well, you know, for the people who are watching me every day that, that I'm guiding from my family uh, as well to the young men I'm coaching, uh, I think it's important every day. It starts with us and, and our relationship there. And I think you have to be intentional each and every day uh, because, you know, there's so many distractions. Uh, that's what the, the devil wants to do, as we well know, is distract us, distort us, disturb us. You know, John Gordon talks about the five Ds. It's so true. Yeah. Uh, about how that is. And so if you're not being intentional to almost feed your soul every day with what you're reading and what you're praying about, uh, you're not going to be equipped to what the daily battles bring to you. A quick break to tell you about our friends at Ronald Blue Trust. Their advisors applying biblical wisdom and technical expertise to help their clients make wise financial decisions to experience clarity and confidence and leave a lasting Legacy, their comprehensive, certified financial planning professionals offer financial planning, investment management services, and like I said, based on biblical principles to individuals and families across the United States who are beyond the debt problem but want to be good stewards of their wealth. Listen, 35 years of experience, lots of questions coming off really in the midst of a pandemic and then kind of six months, seven months in here, what do we do? with our finances. Some of us have been hit really hard financially. Others still have their job, but they're not sure. There's a lot of questions. Ronald Blue Trust is the place to go to ask those questions. Go to ronblue.com. That's their website, ronblue.com. Tell them Sports Spectrum sent you, and I promise you can trust them. Ronald Blue Trust, ronblue.com. Donnie Jones is our guest on Sports Spectrum. I want to ask you, or spend a little time, I guess, on um, on a few of the tweets that you posted. And they were really good ones, most recently, a few of them. Uh, and just kind of have you expand on them, uh, because I think they're really good lessons uh, for us. The first is on prayer. You mentioned prayer. Um, you tweeted, God only gives three answers to prayers. Mm-hmm. Number one is yes. Number two is not yet. And number three is, I have a better plan coming. So, how have you seen the Lord work in your life with those kind of answers to prayers? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question. You know, I think the first one is, uh, you know, we pray all the time. We're always asking for something, uh, you know, it seems like in our prayer. And uh, first of all, it's, it should start with just being grateful for what we have. Uh, so a, a lot of those prayers have, have come and we sometimes we get caught up in our world of, uh, especially in sports, is that we get gratitude gratification from people for our success. We get way too much uh, credit for our success. And as we well know, way too much criticism for, for our loss. And so, uh, but yeah, those, my prayers have definitely been answered obviously with my wife and, and the opportunities that, you know, I started out as a graduate assistant and my climb all the way up to be with some great coaches like Billy Donovan, uh, you know, and there's been prayers sometimes, you know, thank God for unanswered prayers, right? Garth Brooks, and, 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 you, and you're wondering why at the time is it not happening for you? And, and, and if you don't have faith, that's where your faith is tested. Uh, it can be very difficult. And so was a, there was a time for many, many years there that I was hoping obviously to be a head coach uh, in my life. And I was an assistant for a long, long time and wanted to be a head coach, but wanted the right opportunity and the right opportunity come for me. Uh, and a lot of jobs I thought I was going to take and I didn't take. And thank God I didn't. We won two national championships because I came back and that gave me an opportunity to go back to Marshall University as a head coach where I'm from. So, um, and then, you know, the third one, uh, you know, I think sometimes you go through, you know, I went through a coaching change where I was at UCF and I was out there for a year and I, I went with the Clippers. And so you went through kind of that, that growth standpoint where you was either going to grow yourself or, or get caught up and feeling sorry for yourself. And, and I think that sometimes your, your prayers, you kept thinking, Hey, you know, why is this happening to me? And, you know, when's my next opportunity coming? So, you know, God had a bigger plan. And I think you got to stay. It's a test. You got to be able to stay faithful in the test. And we know what the promise is. And I think that's the thing. There's going to be problems in it, but uh, he's going to give you bigger things if you can handle the little things. And I, and I think that's been the big key for the third one is that something better is coming. Uh, you got to stay faithful in the storm here right now, as we all know, uh, that there will be something to be rewarded at the end. But that's the hard part, right? Like, because we, we, something bigger is coming and we're so convinced that, no, that's the big thing. And then it doesn't come and it hits us hard. That's the hard part, right? 
Absolutely. You know, we talk about having little wins, you know, uh, you know, John Gordon talks about win the day. Yeah. Uh, that's a great term, but what's, what's little victories, you know? And it, so that's kind of what it's been building a program. And even during this time, even with our team, we talk about what, what's been your win today. What's been three wins for you today. All right. What, what, what was it? You know, you made a friend, did well in school, um, you know, could be whatever it may be. And I think it's important for us to focus on the little victories right now because there's so many, so many distortions and fear. And, you know, if you turn on TV, as you well know, you just completely uh, can get completely confused with what's going on in the world. So just focus on the, on the good of where you're at right now. So another tweet that you shared reads as follows. And I love this. People will only change when number one, hurt enough. They have to, right? Number two, learn enough. They want to, they want to, and number three, receive enough and they're able to. Can you expand on that and, and the growth mindset you're referring to here? Yeah, absolutely. Well, everybody uh, changes through different situations. And, and I think that's kind of the mindset. I mean, uh, when you coach people, and uh, I say it all the time, I'm, I'm not just a basketball coach. I'm, I'm somebody that coaches people. And, and I think when you're coaching, uh, especially young kids today and, and, and the struggles that they go through, they all learn differently. And there's different things that change them. There's different mindsets that, uh, that's impacted by certain situations. Uh, but it seems like all through all those, it's usually the struggle. Uh, you know, it's usually the pain you have to go through uh, to be able to get to where you want to get to. And I think so many young people today, as you all know, a lot of them come through the, de- through the door. They want instant gratification without, yeah. the, uh, without the work. So I think that's, that's kind of the mindset when I put that tweet out uh, of, of what I've seen and what I feel uh, that a lot of people have to go through uh, from a personality change standpoint. How do you balance the discipline of a coach versus the, uh, the loving side of a coach? Because people think sometimes you're yelling at them. You're, I don't even know if you're a yelling type of coach, but sure. a lot of coaches are. Are they at least you know, passionate and they want to get their attention? How do you balance sort of the discipline side to try and get guys motivated with the same, at the same time loving them and caring for them? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've always been a relationship guy, Jason, even as an assistant. You know, I was an assistant a lot longer than a head coach. And uh, I thought that was my strength that I had to play to. Uh, you know, one of the things Billy Donovan always said is, you know, Donnie, you always got to coach to your personality. Don't, don't, you know, he wasn't Rick Pitino. He was Billy Donovan. And so right. when he tried to be Rick Pitino's personality, he, he wasn't as effective. So I think it's important as a young coach, you realize that. And so, my approach has been, uh, my strength has been relationships uh, off the floor. I build trust. Uh, a lot of people can communicate, Jason, but very few can connect, you know, and I think I'm a connector. Uh, I understand the importance of uh, uh, having a, an intentional approach towards you and growing you, not only as a player, but as a person. So I think my coaching is the same way. So I, I kind of love you first, okay? It's kind of love tough for me instead of tough love, all right? Mm-hmm. There's a truster. I don't have to raise my voice and scream at you if that's the case, then usually I'm setting you out and coaching you later about your behavior or whatever it may be. Uh, we're always looking to build people up. And, and obviously it doesn't mean we don't demand from you. There's a difference from demanding and being soft. And, you know, a lot of people say it's soft coaching if you don't scream like Bobby Knight back in the day. Uh, but kids are different. Everybody can say they're not. They need discipline and you can talk to them differently. They just need to know. Uh, it used to be you could have meetings with players, but they need to know 15, 20 seconds after practice how they've done today. Mm-hmm. Right? Because it's, they're different. And so with that, I think communication is the key. So not meaning to be long-winded. I think it's important that they have an understanding that uh, I'm here to really make them better. And there will be times you have to set kids down and bring them back in and put your arm around them. But most kids today, they get that invisible sign around their neck saying, I want to be loved. Yeah. Right? I care. I want to be loved. So I'm so looking for it. Yeah. Lastly, uh, from the tweet perspective, and I do recommend people follow Coach Donnie Jones on Twitter. Um, you posted pride divides, humility unites. And this is a time where there feels like there's a lot of division and we're looking for unity and we're craving for unity. We want it. And we're seeing sprinkles of it here and there in certain levels. But then there's other sides that is just completely divided uh, on so many different issues. Why those words? Pride divides, humility unites. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, you mentioned it right off. I mean, you look at our world right now, uh, so much ego. You know, ego is, 
uh, is the enemy of greatness. You know, God frowns on ego and pride. I mean, those are the next word after pride in the Bible's fall. And mm-hmm. so it, it divides people. Uh, you know, we, we need to be able to forgive. We need to be able to have grace towards each other. Uh, we need to unite, you know, with some humility. Uh, it's not always the winner all the time and everything we do doesn't mean not be competitive. Uh, but I think our whole approach in the world, if you look at it from the leadership, from the top, uh, to, to all the things that's happening, uh, there's so much ego and pride involved. that's just got everybody in a different place. And so if, if everybody was starting their day spiritually, like, uh, we do, uh, I think it could really show so much more humility in our approach and in, in these lives of people uh, that we see each and every day. Has that been something you've really instilled into your team too, just to talk about the ability to um, play for, you know, your team and having that humility versus the pride of, or arrogance that kind of creeps into all of us every day, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a difference between arrogance and confidence. And, and, and I think that's a huge factor. Uh, you know, I know that my days with Billy Donovan, you know, Billy is a, is a great competitor and, and a very confident about who he is, but, but he is not an ego guy at all. He's very humble and a servant leader. And, and I think the approach is we understand how to compete, but we also understand the importance of humility uh, in, in becoming a team and being able to serve other people. As we wind down, I want to ask you just for a couple stories. Um, certainly, you mentioned two national championship teams. You've mentioned Coach Donovan a few times. Can you give us a story from your time with Florida that stands out, like a moment, whether it was winning the title, maybe it was one of those moments that people don't get to see that sticks out, whether it's Coach Donovan, maybe it's some of the players on those really, really talented Florida teams. Give us a story if you could. Yeah, well, there's so many. Brenton, you said that about five popped in my head, but uh, one story that was really good was Rick Flair. Um, Rick Flair was a uh, Billy Dom was a big fan of Rick Flair when we first got there in the late '90s. Uh, we were trying to get people to come to anything we would have. It wasn't great fan support early at Florida, so we had Midnight Madness and. Remember Jeremy Foley, who's an incredible man, as you well know, a great leader, a uh, yes. great person. He says, Hey, you got to invite Ric Flair to Midnight Madness and we'll pack the building. Billy's like, Ric Flair? I mean, is he going to, are we going to have WWE here? I mean, no, he's <laughs> just going to come here and everybody will come to see Ric Flair. So we invited Ric Flair, you know, to Midnight Madness and it was packed. People were holding up signs. You would have thought he'd come out the center court and, you know, and did his dance and, and the whole deal. So the relationship began. Forward that all the way to 2000, and uh, we had won the first national championship. We're playing for the second one. Uh, we were preseason number one uh, all the way to the end. We're getting ready to play the game against Butler to win to go to the Final Four. Our guys, you thought they had seen a ghost. They were tight. Uh, the locker room, I mean, you could hear a pin drop. Just mm-hmm. so tight. So much pressure to get back there. All those guys have given up the money to, to leave and come back and play. Well, Building up to it, you know, he, Billy kept saying, I'm going to bring Ric Flair here. I'm going to bring Ric Flair here. And we're kind of like, they're not going to know who Ric Flair is. These, these kids, you know, they weren't even born, you know, when Ric Flair was going on. So we started putting all these highlights in, uh, in our videos, you know, so they'd be showing edits of Butler. And then all of a sudden, Ric Flair would pop on this film edit. And he'd be saying, I'm the baddest, I'm the meanest, I'm the toughest. And, you know, the guys would be like, you know, who's this guy? You know, and then Billy said, oh, it's Ric Flair. You guys know who Ric Flair, he had an unbelievable confidence as a competitor, you know. Then all of a sudden, we're sitting there, and we're getting ready to go out in the game, and Ric Flair walked into – we had him walk into the locker room. And when he walked into the locker room, you know, Joe Kim Noah's got an incredible personality, right? He'd become a big Ric Flair fan before he met Ric Flair because of those films. Wow. He saw Ric Flair walk into the uh, pregame talk in the uh, locker room, jumped up – hugged Ric Flair with chest bumping him. They were dancing and it was just kind of like uh, the whole room just erupted and we went on out and rolled and beat Butler and went to the final four and we were celebrating up in Billy's room with Ric Flair. So I, that was one great story. Uh, that was, it was, uh, it, I remember Billy was doing the prayer and there was one of the best of all time. And he was just saying, Hey, and thank God for Ric Flair. <laughs> That's how we ended. So that was, that was a that was a great moment there for our team and changing the yeah. And winning back to back titles just as a fan. That's I mean, I've, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, and I remember when they won in '92 and '93. The '92 one, you were kind of like, oh, this is great. You know, this kind of came out of nowhere. They beat San Francisco. 
the 93 year it as a fan watching was hard and the expectations were like if you lose one game you've just you know disappointed an entire you know country fan base whatever it's hard to win it's really hard to defend isn't it it really is and we came back and we talked about getting to the mountaintop jason the first time but the second time is a different path to get there because of all the success and people you know all of a sudden following these guys around like the rock stars everybody telling them how great they are everybody wanted a piece of it and then everybody played their best every night i don't care who, who we played we got everybody's best so to be able to handle that uh, it was a credit to Billy. Uh, I don't think it was really the hardest year I've ever had in coaching because we knew we had had that magic in a bottle and you may not ever have this chance again. And to be able to to follow through and be able to win it again was one of the greatest uh, accomplishments I know I've ever been a part of that second time with an unbelievable group of people. So correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you coached Michael Jordan's kids as well, correct? I did. So do you have, do you have a good Michael Jordan story only because I, I ask? obviously he's Michael Jordan, but sure. You know, the, the last dance was like manna from heaven for all of us who were just craving for sports. And I watched it and loved it. And it really showed me a lot of things, not just about Jordan, but about leadership, competing, uh, you know, holding grudges, which I saw, and just a lot of different things uh, that were fascinating to watch and kind of a peek behind the curtain of MJ. But you were, I have to imagine, around him a little bit, coaching his kids. What was that like? And maybe if you can share a Michael Jordan story, that might be fun. Yeah, it was really cool. You know, uh, obviously, I, you know, during that time, you know, very similar in age, you know, I was a big Michael Jordan fan. Just who wasn't? I mean, how could you not be at, for the success he'd had? And I'd gotten the UCF job and, and Marcus was already there. He was a freshman. So he was deciding anytime you come in, you know, is the coach going to come back or, or am I going to play for the guy here? So you almost got to re-recruit the players there. So yeah. you know, my first call was to Michael Jordan. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, you know, how's this going to be when I call him? And, you know, very nervous. Uh, and so just calling him up and he was just so easy. I remember him on the other line. Welcome coach. Congratulations. He knew about me. Uh, he had known that I'd been with Billy Donovan. He spoke highly of Billy and, and my success. And I just had a kid that was really good, a Sam Whiteside at Marshall that just went in the NBA. And, oh. and so we had, a, we had a really good talk. And so, you know, his, he, he came in town and came by and met with me. And, you know, I remember sitting there for the first time. I'm in my office, you know, I've been around some really successful people a lot like you, but there's probably one or two that when you're sitting there, you're going, that's a wow fact. I mean, that's Michael Jordan sitting on the other side of my desk right now. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I remember my son at the time who was about four years old, he didn't know uh, Michael Jordan was sitting in my office, but he knew who Michael Jordan was. So he walked in my office unannounced with my wife and the look on his face uh, when Michael Jordan was sitting in the chair, he took off running and hid behind the couch. Wow. You know, he was so like an awe, you know, that this, it was like this superhero was sitting in the office, you know, but, but, you know, I'd say the biggest thing that the respect I have for Michael went through the roof during that uh, couple years that I coached Marcus and being around him, Jeffrey ended up, he brought Jeffrey from Illinois, uh, wanted him to come and play with Marcus and, and both those kids, uh, unrespectful unres kids, unbelievable, uh, easy to coach. Uh, but, it was neat to talk to Michael because, you know, Michael didn't want any special treatment. Uh, he did not. He want, he loved his kids. He wanted them to be the best they could be. Wasn't no pressure to be a pro athlete. Uh, he loved his kids. And you know what? It was neat to see the dad side of Michael, just like me and you. You know, he loved his kids. He wanted the best. He he When they didn't do what's right, he called me about that. When they did do what's right, he called me about that. And uh, But I remember him and Charles Oakley. Uh, showed up and wanted to come to practice. So I'm thinking, golly, Michael Jordan's going to be sitting in my practice today, you know? <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, Michael comes in, he says, coach, would be okay. We'll just sit over on the side. Just like to watch practice. We're in town to see Marcus. We'll take him to dinner. Yeah, no problem, Michael. Come on in. So we start practice and, and you can imagine my guys were probably more intimidated than me, than right. Michael was sitting in there, right? So the intensity level of that practice was probably the all-time best. I mean, guys were diving for loose balls. Guys were defending. Guys were playing hard. And, and uh, you know, it was amazing. And believe it or not, the whole practice, Michael never hollered at me one time. So I got I got off it pretty good after watching the last dance. So, yeah. But, but you know what? Um, but, Jason, just to sum it up, I mean, 
I wasn't really around Michael personally, you know, sure. outside of there, but just to talk on the phone as, as many times as I did and to see and listen to him uh, down to earth, um, obviously loved his kids, one of the best for him and uh, was really, uh, really a neat guy. And, and it's very humbling because as a parent, uh, no matter if you're the greatest player in the world, as you well know, we all still got to coach our kids uh, in their lives uh, with the challenges they have. And he did a great job in balancing that and gave his wife total credit. Uh, very humble in, in his approach. Yes. So I really enjoyed my time. Great family and uh, learned a lot in coaching, coaching those kids and being around a guy like Michael Jordan. I have to imagine the pressure on his sons, you know, and, and you, don't, you don't want to put pressure on them. You want them to be normal and have experience and experience regular th things in life. But man, when you carry that burden of Michael Jordan, especially as basketball players, that's got to be hard. And I wonder what that was like, you know, just watching them. You have to coach them too, right, Donnie? But you also have to watch them kind of live through this life that they grew up with their dad being the greatest basketball player of all time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, my whole thing with them a lot of times, which is easy, easier said than done, is uh, having your own identity. Obviously, yeah. your dad provided a certain atmosphere for you. God made you unique and special. Uh, obviously, Michael is your heavenly or is your earthly father and God's your heavenly father, you know. So you're, you're made different, man. It's, it's time for you. And maybe basketball is not your thing, but, you know, we'll use that to, as a platform for you. Marcus has been very successful. Marcus is... Uh, is is a really smart entrepreneur, doing very well in life. And Jeffrey is working with his dad, a great guy. But, you know, Jeffrey was the firstborn and obviously felt the most heat being the first Jordan uh, to be a player. So I think the pressure was tougher for him early on because of that, as it is for, you know, LeBron's son and a lot of these. So everybody embraces it different and uh, and how they respond to it. And uh, But both those kids have turned out great. And they got a sister as well who's been very successful. That's good. Donnie, this has been great. Thanks so much for being here on the show. As we wind down, last question. Um, can you leave us with an encouraging word? Maybe it's a quote, maybe it's scripture, a uh, verse, or, or something that, you know, that can encourage our listeners as we close and wind down here. Yeah, one of my favorite ones, Jason, I love this. Uh, I think this is very powerful. Uh, what God doesn't prevent, he uses to promote. And I think that's an important uh, mindset as we deal with things right now. And uh, what God doesn't prevent, he uses to promote. And so a lot of people wonder what's going on in this world right now. Why isn't he preventing this from happening of all the things that's happening? But there's a bigger purpose. Uh, there's a promise at the end. I think we all got to stay focused on uh, and understand. And it, our faith is a test right now. It's being tested as it has been for many of us for over 3,000 years, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for us to persevere and be intentional during this time and be even more positive. And that's, that's usually what my whole platform's about on Twitter. Uh, that's, it's all about encouraging people and, 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 and trying to give some hope uh, to, to the ones who are looking for it. And I think it's important during this time that we win the weight, you know, uh, just because I tell our team all the time, just cause you've been delayed doesn't mean you can't have success right now. You've just been delayed. Success is still coming. It's just been delayed. It's coming. What God doesn't prevent, he uses to promote. That's fantastic. Coach yes. Donnie Jones, thank you for joining us, my friend. This has been a real treat and hopefully we'll get you back on. Hopefully I can get down to Stetson sometime and meet you and say hello and, and give you a big old bro hug, but this has oh, been fantastic. I love it. Thanks, man. I love it, Jason. Love the book, by the way. I'm, I'm about the middle of it right now. Congratulations. Very powerful. Thank awesome. you, buddy. Yes. Awesome. And many thanks to Donnie Jones from Stetson for joining us here on Sports Spectrum. As I mentioned, go follow him on Twitter because he's a great follow. Donnie Jones, D-O-N-N-I-E Jones from Stetson. Definitely give him a follow there and let him know that you heard his story. You heard his uh, you know, nuggets of wisdom on our Sports Spectrum podcast interview today. He was great and uh, we got to chat a little bit afterwards too. And just a great, great guy. You know, if I had a son and I want him to play basketball, Donnie Jones is a guy that I want my son to play for. So I appreciate Donnie for being here on the show today. He was great. I hope you enjoyed the Ric Flair story, uh, the Michael Jordan story. That was more for me, but hopefully you got a little kick out of that as well. I can't imagine coaching Michael Jordan's kids. I would be scared to death trying to coach Michael Jordan's kids and just thinking anything I say, man, I got the GOAT 
right there watching practice and and I got his number in my phone. It's just kind of crazy when you think about it. But Donnie seems like a class guy, real humble dude, and just grateful uh, that he joined us here today. Wish him nothing but the best. And hopefully we have a college basketball season and Donnie has a great year for Stetson. Thanks to Donnie and thanks to our friends at Ronald Blue Trust. They are our sponsors today for Sports Spectrum, applying biblical wisdom, technical expertise, and helping their clients make wise financial decisions, experiencing clarity and confidence, leaving a lasting legacy. And it's crazy right now in 2020. We have a lot of questions regarding our finances, and Ronald Blue Trust has the answers. Check them out at ronblue.com, ronblue.com. We also want to direct you to our website, sportsspectrum.com, as the home base for all of our content here at the Ministry of Sports Spectrum. We have a daily devotional every single day at 6 a.m., Monday through Friday, to start your day right with the Lord, intersecting sports and faith. And then we have content all day long on the website, articles, uh, stories of athletes and coaches and their journey to Christ. It's really cool. You should check it out. Bookmark the website, sportsspectrum.com. And lastly... Make sure that you hit the subscribe button as you listen to this podcast on whatever app you're listening to it on so you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast. we got 500-plus interviews and conversations that we've done over the last three years, over 2 million downloads of this podcast, and it's because of you, because you listen, because you're interested, because you check it out, and uh, we just want to continue to bring Jesus back into the conversation by talking to people like Donnie Jones about sports, about basketball, but more importantly, about life and about faith in Christ. Again, hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Again, my name is Jason Romano. You guys are awesome. Love you all. We'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum. I do hope you all have a great rest of your day.